thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, the changes in the process that we established at GitLab on our way to uh, continuous delivery. But this talk is titled this way uh, only because it kind of fits within the track. I prefer the name Kubernetes, the prequel. Um, let me introduce myself uh, first. I'm the engineering manager for the delivery team. Um, I've been with GitLab uh, since September 2012, so that's seven years. And um, I got hired as a, a backend engineer. And through my tenure at GitLab, I changed positions multiple times. Um, I was responsible for the omnibus package, installation methods, and so on. And then recently, I moved into the position of uh, managing a delivery team whose sole responsibility was figuring out how to migrate GitLab.com and all of our release management processes to uh, continuous delivery. Um, to just give you an, a bit of an idea of what we're going to be talking today about, um, I'm going to give you a history overview of how release management evolved at GitLab, um, how the whole team um, that I'm leading right now and the whole process uh, got created, and how we, while we were doing things, uh, started changing things just to make it more interesting. And uh, finally, the results of all of that. And if there is anything I want you to uh, get out of this talk is that there is no shame in trying things out, seeing how you can change your processes around, how you can leverage your legacy tools, even though everyone screams, this is the best thing, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. So to give you a bit of an idea of how we ended up in a place uh, where we uh, started, um, from 2013 um, onwards, actually from 2011, uh, GitLab has had monthly release on every 22nd of the month. We haven't missed a bit in all these years. Um, from 2013, when we formed the company and had more than uh, one engineer, um, we had a rotating release manager role. This was an engineer who was responsible this month for writing a blog post, tagging a version, pushing this out to the public, even tweeting. And in the first couple of years, it was only three of us because we, had, we were at five people at that point. Um, and that meant that a lot of actions that we did were manual, mostly because we didn't have the tools. So I would just log into a machine, build a package manually, upload it to S3 manually, copy the SHA, put it on the blog post, and release it. That was the release process. As we started getting more and more of backend engineers hired, um, they started getting into that role as well. So uh, what happens usually when you put an engineer on a problem, they find a way to get out of it. So <laughs> what they did was automated some of these tasks. Um, but that still meant that a lot of the tasks that we had were follow this documentation, execute this script, do this, do that, all of that manual, because the release manager role was actually a rotation. So all of the knowledge that gets built up during one month just gets wiped clean for the next one. And the idea was also to make sure that we improve things by having fresh pairs of eyes looking at the process. Um, now, we actually had one near miss with our release. We almost missed the 22nd uh, deadline that we had um, back in December 2017. We deployed one day before the release, which was unheard of. Um, I think that was where the alarm started going off, that we lose a lot of knowledge by rotating constantly. And I got tasked, mostly because I'm a loudmouth, I got tasked with um, investigating what happened, how, we, how can we improve this. And as I was collecting data, it became apparent that 
uh, we actually do need to spend some effort in either forming a team that is going to be leading this change, making sure that we don't have semi-automated things anymore, but automated, um, or um, we are never gonna get uh, better at this. So in July 2018, I got two engineers, and um, at some point, someone at the company said, hey, it's great that you're doing all of this automation, and kind of release goes well with Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is this awesome thing, so how about you just do Kubernetes as well? Right? Like, it's easy. Um, they added two more engineers and said, you're going to be the delivery team, so automate the release and migrate GitLab.com to Kubernetes. GitLab.com has millions of users, has a lot of traffic, and that actually is a task on its own. It's a huge challenge. So. Whenever you uh, see someone screaming Kubernetes, I hope you're going to remember this, like this Dilbert fake comic. Um, so I accepted the task. The team accepted the task. It was a great challenge. So we set out to see what are our requirements for everything that we need to achieve. So GitLab.com, live system, we can't have any downtime. So everything we do, we need to make sure that GitLab.com stays up. We cannot move the timelines. 20 seconds remains the same. Engineers need to release code because this is our lifeline. So no delays. Um, you should migrate GitLab.com in the next three to six months to Kubernetes, changing the whole platform. So no time to do this. Great. Um, but one thing that actually stuck with me the most was the question, is our engineering organization ready for continuous delivery? It's great when you're using all the greatest tools, but how you use them is really, really important. So this was the biggest unknown for me. Like, at least in the other three items, I knew that I can't change that. But can I change the last one? So, what do you actually need to do to prepare your organization for continuous delivery? First of all, your development needs to completely shift left. That means that before things get merged into your main branch, things already need to pass all the testing, all verification, security checks. Are, you, are your testing systems solid? Do you have end-to-end -end integration tests? What do those tests tell you? How are you using data and metrics to inform your deployment decisions? And do you have capability to react quickly to any sort of change? And unfortunately, for all of these things in 2018, the answer was no. That was my face when I realized this was a humongous challenge, not on the technical side, but on the process side. So now that I understand all of my requirements and the challenges that I'm going to encounter, what is my team spending their time on? I love pie charts because they don't tell you anything. <laughs> um, but this pie chart is created out of the data we gathered over the 14-day period where the development kind of slows down so that we can prepare for a release. My team spent 60% of their time in the 14-day period babysitting deploys. And then 26% of our time was uh, related to manual tasks or semi-manual tasks that someone had to do writing a blog post or helping writing the blog, blog, blog post, communicating the changes between people, um, doing various cherry picks for P1 problems that the developer found. By the way, if you trust your developer that they understand what the P1 means, you are fooling yourself. <laughs> we also had a manual process where release managers had to do some basic QA. That's kind of silly, so 
Release manager goes in, clicks on a button. Oh, button works. Great. That's check. Done. And GitLab also has a special thing where community edition and enterprise editions were built from separate repositories, and we had to merge one into another because enterprise edition was a superset of community edition. So that took 10% of our time. So if you take a look at the whole thing in, two, in 14 days, in two weeks, we, my team did nothing but sit on the computer and watch, well, paint dry, I guess, in this case. So if we change the 80% of our whatever we were doing during this period, um, we would be able to make sure that we have no release del delays because we'll be freed up to make sure that everything happens in time. If we do deploys quicker and smaller chunks get deployed to production, we would ensure that there is no time, or at least we would be able to control that better. And if we pre free up all of that amount of time, we would be able to actually start working on the Kubernetes migration that we were set out to do. And Another thing that I thought was like a really great bonus here is while we are doing the changes here, we would be able to prepare the organization for the incoming change in process. So that is what we set out to do. Um, if you take a look at the cycle time compression, um, we set out to go there, but we started going down this route instead. So one of the items that we observed is everything was tied into this simple process. How developers behave, how the product behaves. We had a seventh of the month, which was our feature freeze date. At this point, we would branch off from the main line and we would have a slower moving branch from which we would do deploys and prepare release from. This reinforced a really great behavior where developers would kind of pile around at seven because, oh, I have time, seven is in seven days. And then on the sixth in, at midnight, they would panic merge things because they know that if they miss this deadline, they have to wait for the next month. But if they get it under this deadline, they have good two weeks to fix any problems that happen. <laughs> now, we are creatures of habit, right? So I thought, what if we, and I didn't think of this, by the way, a lot of companies do this, what if we speed this up? Like, do the same thing, but just more frequently, right? Like, if it hurts. So this is the same system, but instead of doing one branch, we create three. Every week, we create a new one. Developers get this similar system of, all right, well, I have some time to fix things, but I don't have much time. So I'm going to think twice. Do I want to spend time panicking and like, fixing things quickly, or am I going to like, make sure that things are actually operational before I merge things? It also gave us a bit more time to um, make sure that uh, whatever we deploy this week, um, we can be certain that by the end of that week, uh, the only new thing that is going to bring problems is whatever was created um, with this new branch that is going to go in. We also had great help, and that is um, we got to use the tool that we built. So I mentioned GitLab.com. GitLab.com is one of the biggest instances of GitLab in the world, but we use GitLab to build GitLab, and then we use another GitLab to deploy GitLab. Um, one other thing that we had as an advantage was we had access to all of these developers that were working with us, because if we don't get something that we need, they won't be able to deploy their thing. So they had quite a lot of um, excitement when we came to them and asked, hey, can we improve this feature? How can we get this done better? So 
Some of the release tool styles that you saw the 26% of the time, we automated by just sticking it into GitLab CI, triggering things through the API, and using the scheduled pipeline. So if we need to create a branch, it's set in the scheduled pipeline. It triggers every Sunday evening. Um, any P1 item that comes in, we automatically cherry pick things into the branch that is currently active. We create various issues to track progress through the environments or the QA tasks that need to be executed. And as I said, GitLab.com gets deployed from GitLab, so we had to mirror some projects between instances. And I think um, another thing that is worth mentioning here is like GitLab CI was um, the actual pool to get, or rather the glue, to make sure that this all pulls in one direction that we wanted. And finally, GitLab ChatOps um, feels like an uh, underappreciated hero here, but uh, a lot of the release tasks got automated just because we got um, uh, a very easy access to uh, everything we had to do by using it through Slack, for example. We connect GitLab ChatOps with Slack, everything is there, it's very convenient, you don't have to change uh, your context. So, to explain a tiny bit more how this ended up looking. So the happy developer, as you can see on this side, goes through the whole process, right? Review, um, making sure that their pipelines pass, do some verifications through uh, the review apps that we connected to um, a Kubernetes cluster. And when they're absolutely sure they want to merge this thing, they merge it. Um, usually that means it's out of their hands. Um, that magnifying glass thing and the thing that you see scrolling here is um, our production pipeline. What happens is, what happened was we realized that all of the items we had to do uh, were related to moving the semi-automated tasks into CI. So developer's machine is a machine, and CI machine is a machine, so why not just have it there? And it automatically logs things, and the release manager doesn't have to make sure that they're looking at the screen for six hours while the deploy is going. Now, one challenge that we encountered here was that uh, the tool we had at that point um, was we already outgrew it. So instead of continuing uh, using that tool, we decided what are the top two things that we need to do to make sure that we can deploy safely. First, get the package in. Second thing, make sure that it's deployed in a certain order. All right, well, that's easy. And we uh, rewrote the tool we had. Um, rather, we didn't rewrite it. We just wrote a new tool um, using Ansible. And we placed our CI runner on a bastion host that had access to the infrastructure. That was one of the bigger battles, so to speak, uh, we had to do because we had to get a sign-up from security to put basically a remote code execution machine in our uh, system. We did get to do that mostly because we get uh, a lot of insight in how we can actually make this happen. And um, one of the great things that happened was we now got to connect through all of our environments and do sequential checks as well. So what happens was, thing, uh, like when the developers merge whatever they did, we automatically create a new package. That package gets picked up by our ICR system, deployed on staging, and we got to put automated QA in CI as well. If the automated QA passes, it progresses to the rest of the environments. Um, that meant 60% of the time that we used is now out there. It just happens. We don't have to do anything with it. So the finish line. When we enable the system, same 14-day period, we did free up 82% of our time. CA2E merge also got automated, and the 0.3% you see there is sometimes the pipeline fails and we need to check it to see why it failed. 
That's it. Oops. The release tasks remained relatively high still. Um, the biggest chunk of this 17% here is the security release we need to do. Security release requires a lot of coordinating. There are a lot of stakeholders, security teams, development teams, marketing, and a lot of backporting to prior releases. So that remains like a big chunk of our time. In May 2019, we still had the old system, and we had around seven deploys that month, which was standard for GitLab.com. In June, we cautiously enabled things, and we went to uh, 12, I think. And then, I think I'm super proud about this, August this year, we had 35 deploys um, down on GitLab.com. That means more than one deploy a day. And did I mention that none of this is in Kubernetes? All of this is using our old legacy system. But what happens with this is we bought ourselves time. So my team has time to actually work on the migration. But one of the biggest changes that happened was in the habits of the engineering organization. People are thinking twice when they click that merge button. They make sure that the integration tests are done before they click that merge button. We have all of the developers on call because once we enable the system, the old habits just got exposed. And we had to call a lot of people to help us out with why is our performance going down? Performance going down. Um, why are we seeing the uptick in errors? And within two months of us enabling the system, the whole engineering organization, or rather the whole development organization went on call. Um, sufficient to say, I'm not really super popular there anymore. But where I am popular, or rather where my team is popular there, is uh, everyone is grateful and everyone is excited that when an issue is found, they can fix it really quickly deploy it really quickly, and within a couple of hours of finding a problem, we can push this out to production, which is a huge, huge change. Why is this uh, Kubernetes the prequel? Well, because with us freeing up all of that time, my team migrated one of the services that we had to Kubernetes. So if you go to gitlab.com right now, and try to do Docker pull or Docker push, that is being served from a Kubernetes cluster. We are using successfully our deploy boards, we are using our monitoring successfully, and we are using uh, our web terminals successfully, because obviously we had time to play a bit more than we would usually. Um, that's it from my side. I wanted to leave you with a bunch of links. Um, if you're interested in how all of this developed, uh, you can check out the design docs that we wrote. You can check out where that pie chart you saw originally came from, the GitLab 10.4 release report. And finally, you can follow, follow along our progress with our Kubernetes migration and what kind of challenges we ran into when we started doing uh, the Kubernetes migration. Thank you. Thanks. Questions? We've got a few minutes for questions, so I'll bring you the mic if you want to ask anything. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so uh, you're talking about how sort of like CI, CD, um, enables cloud native, right? Um, and you're talking about a lot of like uh, having to put the entire organization on call and that kind of thing, right? How do you get buy-in from uh, executives to make those kinds of changes? So one thing that I think the executives love is dollar numbers. 
So when they see how much time gets spent on busy work, something that does not contribute to the actual um, goal of the organization, and if you transfer that into a dollar amount, expose how you can change that dollar amount to something way less, everyone starts listening. Maybe they don't understand what we actually did here. Maybe they do. It totally does not matter. What matters to them is that a developer can fix a problem within a couple of hours instead of two weeks, three weeks, a month. And then uh, sort of to follow off of that question, um, how, do you, uh, how do you implement CI CD without having the engineering team be on call all the time? Or is CI CD just a sinister ploy to extract more productivity out of the engineers? So I think the, the, the on-call was not made to make developers less productive. The on-call was developed to create some sympathy to, with people who are actually managing the infrastructure and are on the forefront. And the idea is not to have developers on call. The idea is teach them how to get themselves out of the on call rotation. So think about what kind of problems at scale you need to think about and how to resolve them properly without, um, yeah, just merging randomly. So what I think is, is happening already, like within a two-month period that, that we had developers on call, there are changes in habit. And they're starting to ask the right questions. How can I get access to the production database to, get the, to understand the scale of the problem that I'm trying to resolve? That is a great question to ask, because now you can provide them the data, they can inform their decisions, or rather they can uh, understand how to fix problem on that scale, and they're not going to get paged, or their colleague is not going to get paged. And the organization is getting better with it. And I really do believe that with time, we are going to remove the need for developers being on call. Even if they are on call, they're not going to get paged. And I think that's a great uh, success to this story. At this point, it sounds like you're still releasing once a month. Is that yes, right? correct. Is, are there any plans to increase the amount of times you release eventually? So there is a difference between what we do on GitLab.com and what we do for self-managed release. We already hear from, well, all of you that having a release one, once a month is great, but our organization can't update that quickly. So we don't necessarily want to change that cadence, but we still use the same tools to, um, to release to self-managed as well. So what is actually happening right now is um, we are getting tried and tested product earlier, and once we actually say this is 11.3 release, what customer is going to get is something that already ran. I wouldn't say bug-free because that's not possible, but at least definitely like not as many bugs as, uh, as you usually have in these type of processes. So um, the system enabled us to ship faster to GitLab.com with more confidence, and that actually allows us to make sure that we are not going to have more releases for our self-managed customers, but actually less, because we don't have to create more patch releases, and we get to focus on doing the new features that we want to ship.